Hi, this is Seth Fleischman from World History by a Jew. I uh, want to thank Dr. Josh and Megan for having me back on. Uh, some of you may have seen my previous videos on the channel. I did one on Hammurabi and one on Gilgamesh, and the two most popular ones were probably the Mesopotamian map. Uh, so we, it, it, you should check those out before you see this one. Uh, I think you'll enjoy it. I'm hoping many of you that uh, are watching this video saw the last ones and enjoyed them enough to uh, watch this. So we are now leaving Mesopotamia and we're heading to Egypt, right back to England in I want to say 1850s, 1860s. And then the uh, the Moscow Mathematical Papyrus is named after Galinashev, and I'm probably killing his name. Hopefully Alex Boehner is on and correct me if I'm saying it wrong. Uh, but uh, Galinashev was, is, was not just the first Russian Egyptologist, probably still the best Russian Egyptologist. Uh, he brought the Moscow papyrus back to Russia in the late 1800s. Uh, so these are our two primary sources tonight, and I will refer to a few others, but uh, if you're going to look up two and want more information, those are it. So let me remind you, this is what I said actually in my very first Egyptian lecture. Uh, the reason Egyptologists are so amazing is they took these something that was written in a different script and a different language with different symbols and, and th these this mathematics really summarizes that right so we're this all these scrolls they're written in a different language they're they, they have different characters with different symbols for the math it's in a different context they write word problems different ways they use different formulas it's not easy to figure all this out so it's amazing the amount of the information i'm giving you today that's been that's been discovered Okay, so let's talk about the history of Egyptian mathematics. Uh, what's interesting uh, about any ancient writing system is they basically all start as numbers uh, because uh, in your most, the most fundamental level, what do you need a language for? It's, to, it's really for accounting of some sort or another, to remember how much harvest you got, to remember how much you have stored, to remember how much taxes you owe. Uh, and so these are your, this is really how hieroglyphs got started. The original hieroglyphs were nothing more than a numbering system. Specifically, they, the earliest ones were tags for containers. So you'd indicate in a container how much grain you have stored in that container. Uh, and this would be dated to around 3200 to 3300 BCE, somewhere in there. Our next story in hieroglyphics, uh, and we're gonna discuss this tonight, but the next story that gives us some numbers is King Narmar's mace head. Now, if you remember, King Narmar was featured prominently at the very beginning of lecture two, and we talked about King Narmar's palette. He was the, the king who united Egypt for the first time, uh, circa 3000 BCE. He also gave us a mace head, which I, I didn't get to in that lecture, but we're going to get to it tonight because it's relevant to our mathematics. And then I want to mention the rise in papyrus. I know I didn't mention that above as one of the primary ones. It's not as important as the Moscow and the Rhine one, but the rise in papyrus is older. So it dates all the way back to around 1950 BCE. So it goes back a long ways. A um, few basic ideas of, of Egyptian math. So I want to compare it to a couple other systems. Uh, first of all, they use a base 10 system like we do. So for uh, those of you who watch my Mesopotamian videos, you know that Mesopotamian math uses a sexagesimal system, a base 60 system, versus us, that we use a base 10. The Egyptians also used a base 10, which means you should be doing one of these because it really is much easier to understand a base 10 system. Uh, a base 10 system is gonna calculate just like we're used to. Sexagesimal is like calculating things with two Seth Thomas clocks. Uh, and it's just much harder to get your mind around it, even with simple calculations, just because everything's out of 60. Um, now, I will say, though, the Egyptian math uses base 10, but maybe with mix of more of the Romans, because where the Romans have your the letter I for 1, and the V for a 5, and the X for a 10, and so forth, you also will see these symbols in Egypt that represent the numbers. So it does make it a little bit different than than what we're used to, but it won't be too far off for those of you who are familiar with the Roman numeral system. Uh, I next, I want to give you a close-up. So this is the this is the Rhine papyrus. This is the same uh, papyrus that you were uh, looking at on the right hand of the previous slide. And uh, this is from Mark Milmore. He's uh, I featured uh, him on a couple other slides in previous lectures, but I just want to write, I just want to read you what he says because I really like the way he summarized it better than anyone else. So the Rhine papyrus contains 84 different calculations to help with various aspects of Egyptian life. 
from pyramid building to working out how much grain it takes to fatten a goose. That's great. Okay, now if you look at this papyrus, you can already see these, tr these triangles, right? So you can guess these triangles probably are some sort of geometric equation, and you would be correct if you made that guess, which is the same thing that e Egyptologists first assumed when they saw it. Uh, and also there were, there were other shapes too, right? We have a rectangle here and a polygon and so, so forth. Uh, you see this, this square inside a circle is gonna be relevant to us tonight too. Uh, so we're gonna be, the, most of what we're gonna be talking about tonight comes from, from this source. Uh, now, some, let, let's talk about some basics uh, of Egyptian math, starting with the disciplines. So Egyptian mathematics had arithmetic. I don't, I don't think I'd do a lecture if they didn't have basic arithmetic. So of course they have that. Uh, they have geometry and they have algebra. Now it has been argued that they have some other modern systems, but no one's going to argue with these three. Uh, it, even though it's derived maybe a little bit differently uh, than you're used to, they have these three disciplines. And then their operations are, th their known operations are adding and subtracting, multiplying, dividing, fractions, a whole lot of fractions, which we're going to get to, and square roots. But basically what they are is their system is a lot of adding, having, doubling, and a bunch of fractions. That's the fact to summarize it. You'll agree with me when we get to the, the end of this, the lecture tonight. So, uh, why did the Egyptians use math? Well, they needed for measuring land. All right. They, they, uh, there was a lot of land deals. So you had the temples that would have a certain amount of land. You would have the, the king, of course, would have control over a lot of land. And he would divvy that up to other people. And then by the way, those other people, or maybe just other landowners would then divvy their land up and have people work on it. So there are always land calculations. And we're going to go tonight how they did a few of those, at least in a basic sense. Uh, math was very important for estimating harvest yields. So uh, they had a, this great measuring system where it basically had a measuring stick by the Nile. And however high the Nile went, the Egyptians would do a calculation that this is how big the harvest should be that year. And then, of course, why would they want to do that? Because that's how the government determined taxes. So um, the, the estimated harvest yield, from, which was related to the Nile flood, which was a measurement, would then be used in a calculation to determine taxes for that year. Also, you needed math for calculating temple offerings. And I think all of you, if I'd, if I'd done a survey before, what do you think the Egyptians most need math for? I think most people just in their head would say pyramid building. Uh, and, and why do you need math for pyramid building? First, you need to know how, the number of blocks you need. You want to know the size of the blocks you need. You want to know the angle of the structure. You, want the, the, you need actually to build ramps. You've got to calculate the size of the ramps to move the blocks. You need labor required to move the blocks. It's the amount of time to build the, the, uh, the pyramid, of course, how many labor hours you need for building the pyramid. So uh, this, this, what most people would most identify with as a math requirement is certainly important. But of course, as those of you know, who've been through all my lectures, the big pyramid building era was only the old kingdom. And we're really talking about math throughout ancient Egypt tonight. I think it's time to look at some numbers. All right, so let's look at the actual numbers. And, uh, and I'm, what I want you to do is I want you to look at this chart here on the, the top left as I'm talking. This is, this, this is your key chart. Now, I'm not going to test you on this, but I will remind you if you know, if you have any concept of Roman numerals, uh, this will not at all be difficult for you. It's just, it's different symbols. So uh, you have hieroglyphs for a single unit. That's the single stroke right here. You have for tens, you have for hundreds, you have for thousands, for ten thousands, for hundred thousands, for millions. So this is a single stroke, right? And two strokes is two and three strokes is three. You have this arch, which is really a yoke. Um, so this, this arch is a, is, a, is a yoke for like cattle and it represents 10. And then you have this coil of rope, which represents a hundred. You have the lotus plant, which represents a thousand, by the way, um, you'll always see people talk about lotus in Egypt. Just a funny fact is that uh, Egypt, Egypt, Egyptians didn't actually have the lotus flower. That's, of course, uh, um, from the Far East. Uh, they, it was actually a type of water lily. Uh, but anyway, nonetheless, the lotus, which I'll use the common term, was 1,000. The finger was 10,000. The frog or tadpole was 100,000. And then a deity marked for a million. You would simply combine these numbers just like you do for Roman numerals, and that would give you a number. So if I have one stroke, 
and I have one arch, then that would be 10 plus one, that's 11. Okay, simple as that. Uh, and of course, now we can look at some more complicated numbers. Like I think it's easier if you look at this diagram, right? I think that, that helps some. So if, if in this case, we've got four lotus flowers, so that's 4,000. We're gonna have six coils of rope, that's 600. We've got two yokes, so that's 20, and then we have two strokes, so that's two. So you just add all these up, 4,622. Uh, here's another one if you wanted. So two tadpoles, 200,000, four fingers, 40,000, a yoke, which is 10, plus a stroke, which is one. So 240,000, 11. Uh, and that's, that's really the, the long and the short of it. But the problem with this system is it can get really long. So I want you to look at this. This system works up to around 9,998,999. That's the system and it works very well up till then. Um, but the problem is it gets very long. So in this case for this number, it would actually be 54 characters to get to it, right? So in our system, we need seven characters to get to this. You would need 54 for Egypt because you would need nine of each of them. You'd have to count out nine strokes and nine yokes and blah, blah, blah. All right. Uh, let me just say, because of how difficult this was, I should say at least how lengthy this was, as time went on, the Egyptians, particularly in their hieratic script, did develop special symbols for the more common numbers. But I'm not going to get into that tonight. It's just, that's that's, uh, that's uh, beyond where we need to go. All right. Now, I promised you we talk about Narmer's mace head. You had his Narmer's palette in lecture two. Now it's time to talk about his mace head. And we're going to see what we can get out of math from that. All right. This, is, this drawing is the same as what you're seeing here. So I think you can see the coil here from his hat, just so you can identify it. And then over here, you have the, the square with the two bovine uh, uh, animals here. So this, so this is just a drawing of what you see on the mace head. What can we learn about the mace head? So the mace head is depicting a number of plunder and captives that are brought to King Narmar uh, when he, um, after a great victory. And so here's uh, hieroglyphics at work. So right now we have a bovine, right? So this, this bull, for example, has four tadpoles under it. So this means that the, each tadpole is 100,000, so 400,000 cattle. We have a goat. Then we have this deity, which is a million, all right? And then we're gonna have four more tadpoles, so that's 400,000. And then you've got two fingers, which is 10,000 each, so 20,000. Then you have the lotus flowers, the two lotus flowers, so that's another 2,000. So 1,422,000 goats. And last one, we have captives. So this is the, the hieroglyph for a captive after war. So you have one tadpole, so 100,000, and two fingers, 20,000, 120,000 captives. So already we can see in 3000 BCE, they're using this numbering system. And it's great that even today we can look at it and we can understand what it's saying. Uh, so that, that's the beauty of hieroglyphics once they kind of got this stuff figured out. Uh, now I want to compare the, the hieroglyphic numbering system with other numbering systems we may be fam more familiar with. Uh, so first of all, we have, uh, the, we have Arabic. So Arabic is our way. Uh, it, really, the Indians should get more credit. It should maybe be Indian Arabic, but uh, that's 1965. Let's look at 1,965 in our terms. The Egyptians would write it with one lotus flower for 1,000. It'd have nine coils of rope for 900, six, six yokes for 60, and then five strokes. So 1,965. Look how many characters they need uh, to do what we can do. So, right, so you got uh, 1, 10, 16, 21 characters, but we need four to do the same thing. Uh, now, next, look, let's look at the Roman numerals. See, the Romans don't have it too bad uh, because they are changing symbols for each of these. So the Romans can do 1965 with six letters. The Greeks needed five. Cuneiform, just like us, needed four, but of course, cuneiform is, is more complicated. Uh, and then at the bottom here, we have Biblical Hebrew. Biblical Hebrew, you needed seven characters to, to, to do the same thing. But I just uh, I wanted you to see the, the comparison of the different systems. Okay, so these are the numbers, and I made everyone feel great because it was so easy to see how their numbering system works. And now I'm going to introduce fractions. Okay, so Egyptians loved fractions. 
Uh, but their, their system was different than we're used to. First of all, with a couple exceptions, uh, which I'll mention briefly, all of their fractions are unit fractions. So that's, that, that means they had one fourth, they had one fifth, they had one fifth, but they didn't have two fifths. They had one seventh, but they didn't have three sevenths. They had one eighth, but they didn't have two eighths. And I, I'm gonna explain this in just a minute. We have a term for this and we call it reciprocals. And it's this one over the number. Now, what I want you to see is the hieroglyphs for it because this is gonna come to us a couple times tonight. So the hieroglyph is expressed with this mouth. All right, you see the, this mouth and that's the, R, that's the R sound in Egyptian, but it just means part. So if you see this symbol over any number, that means that's the part, that's really the one. Okay, so in this case, we have five strokes, one, two, three, four, five, and then we have this, so it's one fifth. In this case, we have four strokes, one, two, three, four, we have the mouth, so that's one fourth. You see, it's just this symbol tells us. It can get really complicated though, because I want you to look at this third example. This third example, if you add everything up, right? First of all, we have our mouth, so we know it's a fraction. We've got two coils, so that's 200. We've got four yolks, so that's 40. And then what do you know? We have nine strokes. So this symbol is actually one 249th. Uh, it's not really a common fraction for us today, but like I said, the Egyptians love fractions. Well, fractions in practice. Uh, now, here's where it's gonna get a little bit uh, difficult to explain these, this reciprocal rule, but let's look at, um, uh, uh, and, and let me explain why. Not only do they only have reciprocals, but they're using fractions like we use fractions and decimals. And anyone who does basic math knows a lot of times decimals are much easier to deal with than fractions. Uh, the Egyptians didn't think that way. It was always fractions. All right. In the Egyptian mind, each fraction was mutually exclusive. Uh, so let me explain what that means. In a given value, there can only be one one-seventh. There can only be one one-fifth. There can only be one one fourteenth. Once a fraction took that, that theoretical space in an equation, no one else could get it. That was their real estate. So what I'm saying is, if you look at this example, if you have one seventh times four, all of us would say four sevenths, right? It's not difficult. Uh, the Egyptians, that didn't exist because one seventh owned one seventh. You couldn't have another seventh. So you're not allowed to write four sevenths to the Egyptians nor could you write one seventh plus one seventh plus one seventh plus one seventh because that first one seventh owned the space. Instead of uh, four sevenths, they would then write one se they would say one seventh times four actually equals one half plus one fourteenth. So let me explain uh, that one half in our mind would be seven over 14. So it'd be seven fourteenths. So you'd have seven fourteenths plus one fourteenth equals 8 14th, which would, we would then simplify 8 14th to say 4 7th. Okay, they wouldn't do that whole simplification process, nor are they, were they in the, the business to get the same denominator. Okay, what they want is they, they would leave it to, in, uh, of course, with their own symbols, but they would leave this equation, four, 1 7th times 4 to them would be 1 half plus 1 4th. So again, they would not have 2 fifths. If you had 1 fifth times 2, they would say one third plus one fifteenth. This actually isn't that bad. Um, but then when you get to the larger numbers, like 261. So instead of two times one over 61, you would get one fortieth plus one over 244 plus one over 48 plus one six tenth. See, each fraction has its own space. You can't invade that fraction space. And because of that, these fractions just get crazy. And these aren't the worst examples. I just couldn't fit the worst ones on the slide. So I left it with these just to give you an idea of how bad it can really get. Um, so how did they handle this? Well, anyone doing calculations daily would have tables to help them along. They had cheat sheets um, and uh, these cheat sheets have been found particularly where schools were. Uh, so anyone de dealing with these calculations daily would have cheat sheets to show them how to deal with these fractions. They wouldn't have all this memorized. Um, nor would it be efficient to calculate it by hand every single time. One other thing to mention before we go on to another slide, because I've said many times hieroglyphics can be complicated, let me just say that all the main fractions, which you see here, all the main fractions actually had another symbol for them. Uh, so the Eye of Horus, which is a very, very famous symbol uh, in Egypt, 
Uh, if you look at the I have horse, they actually broke it up into different pieces and assigned a fractional value to each of these individual pieces. So these were the most common fractions and they each got their own symbol from the Eye of Horus. All right, it's just another example of how they could write the same thing multiple times. All right, so I think I crammed enough into your head uh, for this evening. So we, um, uh, you've now seen an introduction to Egyptian mathematics. I hope you have a good taste for it uh, and you at least can identify the numbers when you see them now, right? Uh, but to summarize, we started off going through the sources uh, the few sources we have about Egyptian mathematics. We then talked about the history of Egyptian math and its uh, development over time. We talked about the discipline, the various disciplines like arithmetic and algebra, geometry, and the, the operations. We talked about the practical applications, why Egyptians need this, what they use math for. We then started getting into the, to the learn, learning the actual process of Egyptian math. And of course, we had to start off with the numbers. So we looked at the numbers and hieroglyphs and, and how they were reflected. And then finally, we ended with fractions. And you got a taste of Egyptian fractions, just a taste. Uh, and the, this, hopefully, for those of you who just want to say the very basic, this should satisfy that basic uh, desire for you. But for those who want to know more, uh, we got, we're going to have a sequel here uh, for part two of our Egyptian math. Uh, we're going to talk about the world's most famous ratio, pi. And yes, the Egyptians had a concept of pi. We're going to talk about the big O, zero. Uh, the, and with both of those, we're going to compare to what I discussed in the Mesopotamian videos. So you may want to check this out if you haven't seen them, or maybe you haven't seen them in a while. Uh, we're going to talk about how the Egyptians used algebraic equations. We're going to talk about uh, geometry and practice. The Egyptians were heavy users of geometry. And then we're going to go into their tools. What, did it, what tools did Egyptians need for math? They had their own supercomputer, uh, which you can check out. And then even they can even use a rope as a, uh, as a very useful tool, which we'll discuss. At the end of the second part, I'm actually going to take you through doing some math problems the Egyptian way. So we're going to look at the uh, multiplication the way the Egyptians did it. And then we're going to look at division the way the Egyptians did it. And in both of those cases, I'm gonna, I'm gonna give you a little, mo some modern equivalents that are still used today. And then we'll conclude next time talking about uh, the Egyptians' math legacy, what, what we still have today from, from their efforts. So I hope you'll join us for part two. I hope you enjoy us for part one. If uh, you like these lectures, if you wanna see more of my lectures, then you can subscribe to my YouTube channel. Uh, the the I see, I know the, the address is a little bit long, but if you just go onto YouTube and search my name or search World of Survived Jew, you'll see it come up, uh, one of the first ones. Uh, or you can just sign up for my Gmail uh, list. If you just want to send me an email, I send out a weekly email each week. So I hope you enjoyed it and this one, and hopefully you'll check out another one in the future.